Hello and welcome to my shop here on April 11th. A rainy day here. And uh, day two on this radio. Uh, yeah, there's a day two. After day one, I wasn't so sure there'd be a day two for this guy. But yeah, I've decided to go a little bit further um, with it. Uh, the next step is uh, to find out if I have a speaker that I can, can power from this radio. And this radio has a push-pull output which requires a particular kind of output transformer, a center tapped. A transformer with a center tapped primary is required. Uh, I've got three speakers. Um, all of them have field coils, which is what this radio is really looking for. But I don't know that they have center tapped transformers, any of them. And I have them here in my shop. Each one is still connected to its uh, to its board so it's a little awkward uh, working with these things but we're going to look at each speaker one at a time uh, kind of come to terms with what the speaker is and then consider whether it can be used on this radio and I, I think it's a fairly straightforward thing if none of the three of them are suitable for use on this radio then I really I really don't don't know where I'm going with this I, I don't I don't know what I can do with it so okay let's uh, hey how about getting a cup of coffee and then we'll look at these speakers Okay, let's start with the first speaker here. Oh, okay, so this is the first time I've looked at these. Uh, uh, a fellow, uh, an acquaintance of mine, if I can put it that way, uh, showed up one day with three of these and said, here, you want these? <laughs> Here's one of them. A big tear. Oh, it's very fragile. It's very, very stiff. You can see the seam running down here of the original manufacturer's seam. And uh, a large split here. I've seen this before. And you'd think somehow this would have been treated by the manufacturer, but or did that somehow occur later? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, let's see what kind of speaker this is. So we can start with the plug. So the plug has two two sets of uh, terminals here. Maybe this way, or I don't know which way, but two of them are going to uh, head up into this field coil see the wires from here then I see one two three wires going into the transformer so this one is designed uh, for the kind of radio for for this kind of radio a push-pull arrangement that's what I think I got one already Wow I didn't think I was I didn't think any of these were gonna work out I really didn't Okay, let's look at the other two here. So we, we have one. Now, whether it fits in the cabinet is gigantic. All these speakers are gonna they can be fit in there somehow. Here comes another one. Okay. And they all they're all still mounted to their original baffle boards, which is one of the reasons they're still here. So start with the plug. We see five five pins coming up five wires. Oh, that's a good sign. And something's been done here. This is not original. Because, uh, let's see, two of the wires are heading for the field coil. And you can see some that uh, looks like uh, scotch tape here. Only two wires going into the transformer. The transformer screwed on there. I can see a, like a shadow of where a larger transformer was sitting this side over here uh, didn't, isn't even a screw holding it doesn't quite fit you can see these wires here they're just twisted together uh, whoever did this didn't have a soldering iron they just twisted them so uh, this guy's got a looks like a hum coil arrangement don't know about the other speaker I looked at didn't notice so this this could well have been a look at this big mounting spot here so what was mounted here uh, I don't I don't know why it would have two two mounting spots but uh, obviously I think the original transformer was sitting here as a big guy okay this one's not going to help because somebody's already changed it probably changed it from the push pull to a single-ended type amplifier, a regular type amplifier. Okay, I got one more to look at. The 
This one looks very similar to the uh, first one. Oh, it's marked right on it. GE KM67. This is from a, a KM67. Three terminals in the plug. So that's a sign that this is not going to work. Not going to have the uh, transformer for uh, for a push pull. Bend these too much. This is pretty weird. What's going on here? So we have we have four wires coming out of the three terminal plug here. Um, so the secondaries of the output transformer are down here. This is one wire going in as a primary. This is another one. So it's got a again a single single primary, it's not a center tap primary. Uh, this was probably a hum, hum coil, this little wire you see here, probably goes in, goes a couple times around and comes out again. And gets attached to these guys down here. Okay. I don't think that's attached. Hmm. Let's see what's going on here. Well, I can't be sure, but, but this, this can't be used anyway with the radio I'm working on. A lot of dust up in there. So let's get back to one that I think can work. Here. Now, there's lots of issues. Uh, um, you know, you can't just throw one speaker in place of another. Not so much the voice coil and that kind of arrangement. The other problem, the problem here is there's two coils in this speaker that are really important. One is this big field coil here that's making the electromagnet. It has this heavy, heavy wire here coming down. And the other one is the output transformer in here. Both of them are designed for a certain kind of current flow, you know, based on the radio they were intended to go in. If you run them with less current, well, uh, in the field coil here, you get less magnetism with less current, it, it, less volume. I suppose that's all it amounts to is less volume. On the output transformer, if it's designed for a heavier current than the radio is going to supply, don't know if that would make much difference at all, really. Uh, there's two currents going through the transformer primary. There's a steady DC current going through that's... Uh, just part of operating the vacuum tube. And then there's the signal current going through. Um, now what if the opposite is true for these two guys? Let's suppose the current is way too high. Maybe it's double. Maybe the amount of current is double. They have double the current in here. This guy's going to get really hot. Even with regular current, this should get warm. It's, it'll be designed to, to allow for it to get warm. I think it would get really hot take a while. There's a lot of metal here. Take a long time. So take time to find out how hot this thing is really going to get. Same thing in here. If the uh, plate current um, for the output tubes is too high or higher than intended for this pretty small transformer, then uh, it's going to overheat and it's also going to be a slow, a slow process. And if you, if you really overheat these things suddenly if, if you were to like put in like four or five times the amount of current that they're really made for the outside of them is not going to warm up it's going to take time but the inside can get really hot really fast and the, and the way these things are looked at at least in the power industry that I'm familiar with there probably something similar was done here the assumption was there's a high temperature you don't want to cross let's say it's 90 degrees C so then you think further thinking well if this whole thing were 90 degrees C, there's probably some spot inside that, for some reason, is extra hot. There's just probably, if the average is 90, there's some hot spot that's going to be above 90. How do you get to an average anyway? So that thinking, uh, and giving consideration to the idea that there could be a hot spot in the way this was wound or who knows, 
um, that but there's a there's a allowance made for that um, and that's how they rate these things now there's no issue normally with anything with current going through it the issue is how hot is stuff getting especially in a power system or something like this it's not limited by the amount of current you can put through it it's limited by how hot you want to operate it so something like this I would imagine if it's so hot that if you, if you, if you did this oh that's probably too hot but if you can go wow this puppy's warm like that it's probably okay um, a lot of electrical stuff can operate at a surprisingly high temperature so uh, okay well I think we, this is worth a try. I don't. It looks fine. It looks to be in good shape, actually. Now, there's no way I can plug this directly in. I'm going to have to use wires and uh, some some way. Do I have a, Do I have any of these sockets anywhere? I don't think so. Okay, I got to think about how am I going to make a connection between here and here, and what are the steps in doing this? Man, actually, the first step is just to hook up the field coil. In like fact, the first step, really, I could power this radio up without the speaker. The field coil would be missing. Part of the power supply would be uh, cut off, it would not receive any power, and most of the radio would not receive any power. And that could be a testing step, even without the speaker. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I'm going somewhere. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to have some coffee. Okay, before we get too far into this, is there some way we can find out if the speaker works without, you know, firing it up entirely? And I think so. I think there's probably a little bit of magnetism left in here. And if I put a strong enough signal on the voice coil, I think we're going to hear it. So, just a tiny amount of uh, magnetism in there. Not a lot. But let's give it a go anyway. It's an interesting experiment, I think. I'm interested to find out. Now, I think I had a speaker playing in here the other day. Uh, field coil not energized, and yet it was it was it was working. So that's kind of a surprising thing. This is just a signal audio signal generator. Just an old old thing. Okay, so we're gonna make sure the output is minimal. I'm going to clip this onto the uh, voice coil terminals on the speaker, which I'm pretty sure it would be. Here, I guess I guess we'll be energizing the secondary of the output transformer too, but that doesn't matter. I just want to hear if we can hear anything. Band C, about 3,000 hertz. Let's turn it down a little bit. There it is. Yeah. Uh, what if I boost the magnetism? Does it get stronger? This is just a very strong speaker, speaker magnet here. So I'm just going to stick on the top here and see if this gets louder. Didn't make any difference that I can hear. So I, uh, <laughs> seems like every so often my tripod just likes to just give out here. I got one leg with a bad clamp. Not me, my tripod. Yeah, there. I think it does make a difference. Very subtle. Can't be sure. That's my strongest magnet. I'm pretty sure. I got something even stronger here. Wow. This wasn't a good idea. <laughs> Look what I've done here. I keep all my magnets up on the ceiling on that piece of metal going across. Yeah, this big one here is one of those like uh, put your knives on it you know mount this in your kitchen and mount your knives and i haven't used it yet i can mount it somewhere here someday but i can't get it off <laughs> i can't get it off the strip that's a strong one okay <laughs> hey well 
welcome to my shop. Okay, so this speaker has the potential to work. Now, what about the feel coil? There's no reason to think it's defective in any way. Right? There's just, there's no reason to suspect it of anything. What are we gonna do with the radio now? So I'm in a position to actually turn this radio, get this radio working if I, if I did enough to it. Like, like wire up the speaker and that. But look at this radio, I mean, it's, it's not very inviting, that's for sure. It's got these capacitors, which are obviously shot. Uh, well, you know, are they? All this white compound coming out of them? You would think so. Um, for the filtering of the power supply in these radios, the bulk of it, in my, in my view, is done in the uh, field coil, or choke coil, if there happens to be a choke coil in the power supply. And that makes the uh, filter capacitors, uh, this has got to be one, this is probably the other. Why are they so far apart? Why did they do this in this radio? They clumped everything together here. All these tubes are just clumped together. Uh, I mean, you think that it spread them out a little further, a little bit cooler. Why did they clump them all together? I mean, some of them are wired together, so there's a reason for them being close. But why, why this way over here? Are they doing two different, total, totally different things? This is the uh, rectifier tube, and it's, this has got to be part of the power supply. Here's the transformer, rectifier tube, filter. What's this one doing way over here? Maybe this one is a bypass uh, capacitor for the output uh, tube cathode resistor. I don't know. And I'm just debating with myself about powering this thing up. You know, I'd like to take some risks now and then. out of the way here for now. So the first step would be powering up with no, no speaker anyway. Wow, the speakers are hard to uh, do something with. Like put them down somewhere. Well, we should look at the schematic and see how much of this thing gets fired up I plug it in with no speaker. The transformer gets energized and I think one filter capacitor will be energized and that'll be pretty much all of it. Not much at all, eh? just just a few parts. And, and look at that. I don't think I can energize this with these looking like that. I, 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 think, I think it's kind of obvious that I'm gonna turn this guy right over. Can turn this radio right upside down. It'd be sitting right on. It'd be sitting on this tube. What, how did I get a look at it yesterday? I think I was just holding it, laying on its back. Turn this on? Really? You really want to turn this thing on? I do. I do want to turn it on. Okay, let's look down here. What's going on here? So this is where I noticed the uh, capacitor that's right across the power cord. I see some new solder, but that's for the power cord. Now this capacitor has a band on it and it's grounded to the chassis. It's bolted down to the chassis. It's, it could well be two capacitors in one. So that guy could be in trouble. And then from there, the power cord comes over here. It's the original power cord and that goes up. Let's get the other camera going here. Some, some more light on it. Follow, we'll follow that power cord. Follow that power cord. Now I think I've got automatic focus on, so this this might not work out well. But let's see how far we can get with it here. So that's coming. Here's the incoming power cord. 
the capacitor uh, right across the power line. And then we see the power cord continue along all through here to the other side of the radio. Well, that's kind of odd, eh? It's like the switch, usually the switch is mounted on the back of the volume control. Oh. Oh, there's a lever coming out of here. That's how it's turned on and off. Huh. Okay. And this is probably off now. I've probably got it switched off. Well, oh, so that's not the entire power coming over. <laughs> if it was, um, to closing that switch would be a big problem. So it's just one leg being uh, brought over for the switch. So we can probably see that, yeah, right here. So the power power comes in on here, heads out on the brown wire over to the switch and comes back on this wire where it meets up with the the uh, what is it doing here? meets up with two wires well what one is the switch and the other one is this is conveying all the power into the radio and it looks like it's heading into the power transformer which is what you would expect okay there's nothing unusual here what I found in my experience is the, the more time you spend looking at this stuff, even if the excuse you're using is baloney about why you're looking at it, that's when you get your chance to spot stuff you you know you don't know is in here until you see it. Oh my darn! There we go. That's better. Look at those beautiful coils, eh? It, to, to me, to a large degree, the radio is these coils. This is what the radio is really all about. Oh. Now I was going to say, look, there's a burn spot right here, but it's not a burn spot. It's where the uh, wires go through a hole to the inside of the, of the coil, inside of the coil form. Cool. And then come over here. Why, why is it it's centered right on the switch? The fact that What the heck is this? So now didn't I figure out yesterday this drives the piece of paper that shows you what band you're on with its own string. But it's doing more. It's it's hooked up, yeah, I didn't notice this hooked up through this cable. Yeah, when I say, wow, this, this, this is a real, uh, this is a masterpiece. This is a masterpiece. Now what's going on inside these coils? I mean, there's a shaft going through that flat piece. Maybe it's just traveling through, not doing anything. Coming out the other end here and reaching the switch. So there's a wafer switch here wafer switch here you know what I've got I've got something that's very similar to this but the shaft wow that is driven all the way through all the way through what you see down here but the shaft doesn't come any distance up it's because its only purpose is to link into the uh, wafer switch here holy smokes carefully laid out wires <laughs> big resistor there Lots of mica capacitors. One's got 75 written on it, right on the side. This is the uh, television input or audio input. So it must be running up this this cable. This one here. 
all the way up to these push buttons. Mono or television. <laughs> television. Tone. This is probably where they realize, oh my gosh, the word we've picked is too big. Television is too big. We should have picked a smaller word like, you know, phono, radio, tello, something like that. Tone and tone, but it doesn't say what the tone is. Okay, nothing unusual here. Might as well just keep on looking at stuff. Now, what are these, what are these two capacitors doing here? Is it some chance that these are replacements for the leaky ones up on top? Or these are just more? We have, we have to figure out if the ones up on top have been dealt with or... Uh, and I'm talking about this, this guy here. Blue his top. He's blowing his top. Very, very slow autofocus, and I move the camera around quickly. Look at this resistor's got wax dripped all over it. Looks like wax. From where? These are pretty, these are pretty large. Uh, these could be not mica. Uh, trying to read the manufacturer's name on it. I'm going to fix the focus on this camera here just so we can get as close as possible here. So just bear with me a moment while I do that. I'm literally going to fix the focus up close. About like that. Like a mold. <laughs> yes! The mica mold. So this company, Mica Mold, made molded capacitors which were not mica. And this could easily be a paper capacitor inside. It's pretty large, pretty thick. Okay. No particular issue at the moment, except you might think they're mica and they're highly reliable when in fact they're not. These old capacitors, you know, as, as capacitors go, they don't look that bad. They, but they probably are uh, leaky to some degree. There's a lot of them in here. A lot of capacitors here. So you think that's still moisture proof? 0.25 is a big one there. Another one of these mica molds hidden up here. Oh, this is kind of in behind the coil. Another capacitor here. All these parts could be in position critical operation in the sense that if you replace the part and change its position a little bit, it might throw things off. How do you know? How can you know? This is the tuning capacitor. Well, right in behind these buttons is the tuning capacitor. Uh, can't, can't make it out on the camera because of the focus, but the uh, you can kind of see the capacitor uh, plates are just in behind here. So this whole piece has the capacitor hooked up to it. So, uh, so these are probably mechanically driving the... Yeah, there's the mechanism moving. Oh, son of a gun, got just too much focus there. Hang on. Let's do this. So I push a button. You can watch the... Um, not that one maybe. This one. How about this one? I like this kind of mechanism. Some other radios. When you're pushing these buttons, you're not actually tuning the reg. The you know you're not just tuning the reg uh, radio. You're actually selecting a different set of coils. So they would tend to snap in. This feels more like the push buttons in an old car. You can tell it's moving a mechanism when you push it. 
works good. Then the adjustment is probably this screw here. You probably have to pull these off somehow. Some, there's different ways of doing this and some of these radios you, you push the lever down. There's various ways. But you know, how could you get at that screw with this? I don't want to pull this off. These buttons, by the way, are in great shape. This is one of the few radios I've seen where all the words are in good shape here. It's one of the very few. Usually those things are all wrecked up, mostly, I guess, from people putting their finger on it, wearing them out. Well, I'm more and more encouraged all the time to try uh, try to uh, start this radio up. And I just noticed another large capacitor over here. A big one, and it's tied, it's soldered to the chassis here. Oh boy. String, I better not pull it off, better leave it, because sometimes even the remnants of the string can be hints on where it went. Oh yeah, wow. What's going on here? This seems to be wrapped in two places on the uh, shaft. Like there's two strings plus three, three strings in this radio, three separate strings to do the job. Oh my. Sometimes it might have one string moving the pointer, one string moving the capacitor, and in this radio, the last string pulling the uh, band indicator strip. Okay, you know, with the radio up like this, I have good access to the terminals here for connecting the speaker, if I wish to. We need, next step, we need to look at the schematic and analyze what will happen if I put power to this radio just as it is now, no speaker attached. Uh, we'll just see how far the, uh, how, how far the electricity goes. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, pow power supply area down here. So we'll zoom in on that part of it. So here's the plug, and here's the capacitors. The capacitor I saw that's uh, strapped to the chassis. So it is actually a two, a double capacitor. It's right across the power line. It's energized anytime the radio is plugged in, regardless of the switch being open or closed. Now there's a lot of radios like this. It's not my, it's not, I don't think it's the best idea. Why, why didn't they put it on this side? of the switch. What were they thinking? I don't know. But anyway, that's where it is. So if these capacitors are bad news, uh, plugging in this will, you know, let us read the bad news fairly quick. So my options here, I could cut these out, just cut them out and don't worry about it right now. Who, who needs them at the moment? Nobody. And then that would, that would eliminate that problem. Or just plug in and plug in with the switch open and see if something happens here like uh, smoke and flames okay so that but that's it that's it for the uh, power from the wall now uh, coming out of the transformer we've got uh, a couple lights and heaters type 44 light bulb on the other side we've got the high voltage uh, plate winding here attached to the filament because there's no cathode in here 5x4 Ooh, you know I think that's a rare tube uh, big 450 volt capacitor not a big capacitor but a big voltage here here's another one C35 C32 are those the two tall guys 300 volt 30 and 25 those are probably the two tall guys. Why are they on other sides of the radio? I guess this one is working deeper in the in the circuit somewhere. Well, I guess they're able to locate it physically quite a distance away from this one. They're normally they're pretty close together, side by side type thing. Now there's a bunch of other electrolytic capacitors I saw. This is the symbol they're using here. Uh, for these, let's see if that symbol shows up anywhere else. Just a quick, quick glance through here. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of capacitors in this radio. 
Uh, I don't see any others showing that style. So maybe that style is them trying to indicate these are in cans. The style of symbol they're using. I don't, don't see any others anywhere. And I could have overlooked it um, just now, but I don't think so. So those are probably the two can can guys. Uh, often these cans are multiple units. Let me look. Well, here we, we can flip back in a minute. We'll check and see about these capacitors. Um, now another thing I, do, I can pull this tube out, and that'll stop anything from happening out here. And all we'd be doing is just energizing basically these capacitors, the heaters, and we'd be supplying a high. Uh, we'd be supplying the heater voltage here, but it's not going to do anything. And we'd be supplying the plate voltage, and it wouldn't be doing anything at all. So we, we, we could do that if I'm, I'm you know, that that's a real that's a really scared approach to it. Um, so I'm just picking up options. You know, so then we could energize it without the tube. Then we could put the tube in. You know, another thing I do with the tube out, I can apply a high voltage to to this wire here or maybe I'd have to do it on this wire and then cast high voltage throughout the radio. Ooh, this doesn't look like the right place. This is, where is the right place? Yeah, yeah, right here. That is the right place. And I, I could uh, sort of drive the B plus system in the radio from a power supply and I can observe the amount of uh, drain on the power supply uh, to see how bad the situation is before trying to power it all with the actual power supply. So this, what this looks like is uh, no speaker attached, no tube in, power up the radio, see what happens, check these guys somehow, I don't know how you check them, talk to them, ask them how they're feeling, give it a little bit of time, you can observe which tubes are heating up during that time, maybe, maybe, maybe find some that don't heat, that have an open filament or something possibly. After that test, uh, we then pop in this tube. We still don't have the speaker in. So with the speaker not in, um, where's it? here, here, up here. Uh, with the speaker not in, then we don't have any B plus going anywhere. Like it's just not, it's just gonna end right here at the socket. So it's not gonna go anywhere until we plug that speaker in and there's no plugging it in I'll have to wire it up okay that's the steps I'm gonna have some coffee let this kind of percolate in my head for a bit and then we're gonna try some of this stuff okay so the uh, the cord here is really filthy I'm gonna try to clean some of it up and the uh, well, that's going to have to be sanded down. So there's no brakes on the cord anywhere, which is good. Especially right up in here. Hey, it looks like new now. Look at that. That should make the radio work better. Nothing like a clean cord. Sort of clean cord. Okay. Now. this in now we're going to start this up using the dim bulb uh, light system you got to go higher in the sky here there we are so the objective is to find out um, is that capacitor going to blow up smoke or anything like that probably not and is the primary of the transformer okay probably is we're probably not going to find much out at all in fact Just reduce it to one bulb. Okay. Put this where we can see it. How's that? Okay, we're ready. Let's 
speaker not plugged in. Field coil not in place. Heater is going to heat up. Can't see the heaters like this. We cannot see the heaters. We must be able to see the heaters here. Uh, there. Wow, these are this is tricky. These tubes are all almost uh, amazing. I got to you know I got I got to clean these tubes a little bit so we can see what's going on. Oh, okay. Let me let me do that. Clean them up. Here, check out the contrast between just cleaned up okay and look at the tubes that I haven't cleaned yet. Wow. This tube I just cleaned up. 6P5G. Uh, it appears to have a manufacturing defect. Can you see that funny patch there? So this is the silver stuff that's inside the tube and there's some weird gap there and a strange swirl down here. So what that means, I don't know. I, I think it came out of the uh, factory like that. You'd think they'd spot it visually and it would be rejected, but maybe not. Maybe it's not of any significance. So I've never seen anything quite like that. See that big gap down at the bottom there too? Strange, eh? Okay. But I, I don't have any reason to think that's a problem in itself. The material here on the inside is the uh, getter. And, uh, okay, one more, one more tube in the back corner there to clean up. Okay. Okay, so this next tube also is 6P5. This is the one with the loose glass the glue has given out in here, the cement that holds the glass to the base. So what's keeping me from turning the glass further now is just the, uh, the wiring coming out of the glass base and going into these pins. So if you, you twist this, you're straining those, those that wiring. And you can have trouble in there. Well, the tubes will fail because of that reason. Now here's something else too. Can you see in the bottom of the glass? Can you, hear, can you hear? I'm going to hold this up near the microphone. I'm going to do this. There's something flying around in there. It would look like a little bit of glass. Oh, that's not a good sign. Does it mean the tube is bad? I don't know. It's got two strikes against it now. It's got a loose, loose glass and uh, something loose inside it doesn't doesn't mean there's something wrong with the tube so I can certainly see these ones heat up let's take this big guy out of here so I'm, I'm trying to avoid pulling the tube by its glass globe for exactly the reason I just showed you on the other tube what a big monster this guy is. It's a uh, Cunningham. Oh, okay, I got a Cunningham. I've got a couple of gigantic Cunningham tubes. 5x4, that's what it's supposed to be. So once I see where the thing is, I put my thumb like this, and it reminds me what not to wipe. Don't wipe there. Because I don't want to wipe off the numbers. It's not easy to figure out what a tube is when the numbers are gone. In fact, it can be pretty much impossible. Some of them, yeah, you can just look at them and tell. But, uh... Now, is it bad to have dirty tubes? I'd have to guess a little bit. I have to guess it interferes with the tube's uh, cooling. All that dirt on there, I mean, that's can't imagine it's going to be hotter now. Okay. This guy's got a more expensive socket than the other tubes. Just looking at the amount of rust in there, I keep asking myself, what are you doing, Jim? <laughs> this is not gonna this is not going to work out. Even the magic eye tube here. 
could potentially uh, I could see the uh, filament in it or not. The magic eye tube has no benefit to the operation of the radio. It's just eye candy. So if it, the magic eye doesn't work, it doesn't mean anything. But the uh, radio is operation. And most of these are burned out anyway. They, they, don't, they didn't last very long in operation. And radio owners stopped replacing them because what for? They found out they don't help the radio's operation. Okay, so we're ready now to fire up the transformer primary and the secondary that drives the tube heaters. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to I'm going to take all these covers off. I'm going to reveal all these tubes too. And we're going to get a look at them. But coffee break time has come. So taking these tubes out involves taking off the uh, grid cap connection and one tube already has its its uh, grid cap loosened, that's this one. So I'm leaving that alone. Uh, in order to get these off without working the, the uh, top of the tube too much, I try to find the split on the, uh, on, the on the cover and then on the clip, I don't know what to call it, and I try to expand it. You hear a little click? And that sort of breaks it off the uh, breaks it off here without putting any twist into it. See this one right here. And my fingers aren't the best maybe at doing this. There goes that one. Ooh, what a terrible sound. Okay, it's loose and is that the sound of the glue giving out on here? Don't think so. Yeah, I think they're all okay, but not this one. So I'm going to leave this one alone. I want to get these covers off to clean the tubes. And I can see if uh, if the tube is lighting because that that's something I can do at this point. There we go. Filthy. Look at this. Just yeah. Okay. Cl cl clean some more tubes here. More tube cleaning. Something that's a little bit interesting is uh, that all these tubes have stickers on their sides. Now that dates them back to the time where. Tubes are just not reliable. In the uh, tube factory, I've seen a video of this. There's lots of video, a couple of videos anyway on YouTube of tube factories operating back in the 50s or the 60s or whenever it was. And uh, right at the end of the tube line, after the tubes have been built, there's a lot of handwork going on in the uh, process of building a tube. The tubes go into this big carousel size of a card table, like a round card table. The tube goes in and then this and there might be twenty tubes in this carousel. And the carousel advances one step and a test is applied to the tubes. Another step, now this tube is getting the plate test. Another step, now it's getting the grid test. I'm just making that up. I don't know what the tests were, but it's some kind of test. If at any time it failed one of these tests, a kicker would kick it up and then push it and it would fall out into a slot and it would travel down the slot into a box and all the tubes that failed for that one reason ended up in this box but whatever that reason was they could look in the boxes and then they could say oh you know what something's going wrong in our assembly line at so-and-so station because look at how many tubes are failing here they could do stuff like that not, not, not just remove the tube because it failed but actually uh, help to improve the manufacturing system of the tubes. The failure rate, I think, was fairly high. I mean, why, why would they do this carousel with automatic kicking uh, if it wasn't the fact that the failure rate was quite high? And that. So, let's pull this one out and we'll read the sticker. Guarantee. Wow, that's a, I can't really read that without doing 
doing this. Sears guarantee every super silver tone tube to give you perfect satisfaction for one full year. If any super silver tone tube should fail to give satisfactory service for one year, provided it has not been burned out or short-circuited accidentally, return it to us and we will replace it without further charge. Sears, Roebuck and Company. Date of purchase that's not marked. To be filled in by the salesperson. So he's supposed to write the uh, date there, but he didn't. That's too bad. That means if I take this back now to my Sears Roebuck story, and I, I, there were never any Sears Roebuck stores in Canada, I don't believe. Sears, yes, Sears was here. Uh, but if I did, I'd walk in with this and go, hey, hey man, I'd say, oh, it's been more than a year. Yeah, I'd say a little more than a year. Service. The amazing thing is I could take it in and go, hey, look at this tube, it still works. <laughs> That's more likely the story. There we are. All cleaned up and ready to go out on a date or something like that. Go see his friends. Maybe when I turn the power on, it's a little like having a party. I don't really need to put these caps on, but I may as well. Now, what, what happens if you operate the radio uh, uh, without these covers? Uh, it probably uh, there will be oscillations between them, something bad will happen, there will be oscill oscillation, but not now, because no B plus reaching these tubes until that speaker is finally hooked up. So all we're testing right now is the primary winding, first with the radio switched off. Everybody stand back. With the radio switched off, we're going to test the primary winding and the, capac the line capacitors. And it's a crude test. We're just going to be looking at these dim, dim bulb lights here. Only one is in right now. I don't think it should glow with just the primary and the capacitor sitting there. So I think we should see nothing, basically. Okay, so switch is off. So first thing we're testing is, is off really off? Here we go. No, apparently off is not really off. Something, something was, oh. Was it was it was it the pointer here? Yeah, that's what it is. This meter going over. Cause I got this cranked way up from the last project. Take it back down, Jim. Okay. Try again. Nothing should be happening. So you see no no light here. How much current is being drawn? So basically a zero. So I think we're okay. Now those capacitors could could go downhill and they, they could be warming up right now and after a little while, but I don't think so. I think it's very, very unlikely. So I'm not going to worry about that. Good. So first test, all is well. Did any tubes heat up? No, I haven't turned it on yet. Okay, power off. Power off. Now this will engage all the heaters and all these tubes uh, but it, it will not produce high voltage because the circuit is open as long as the speaker is not connected so we're just going to heat the tubes up and see what happens and maybe these lights will come on and anything else happen nothing else should happen so switch is on here we go watching those dim bulbs standing back too Ooh, that's a bright one. But there's a lot of draw. All through all these tubes here. That's so I mean it's not even enough power to, to, to operate this. The voltage coming over here is really low. Oh look at this. These lights are coming on. You can't see them, but I can. Hey, that's an idea. I can't see them. Let me turn this big light off here. That's not a big light. <laughs> So th this <laughs> this is pretty bright here. Um, looking at the tube heaters at this point, it's 
considering how bright these bulbs are, let me turn off some more light. Turn down some more light here. I'm turn it right off because the uh, the dim bulb is, <laughs> is producing enough light. Okay, so now you can see the two light bulbs pretty easily. I would say none of these tubes are showing any heating effect yet. Nothing. Okay, so what we're going to do, since, since this is a good indication the lights are on, is we're going to raise the supply voltage and current by screwing in another dim bulb, the other dim bulb, because this is probably dropping. There's probably nothing left coming over here. These will get brighter right away. There we go. Okay, so heater, 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 and heaters. And this one tube here, yeah, they're all heating. All tubes are heating. Good show. Now, is there any reason to leave it on like this? Was well, there some advantage to doing this? I'd say everything's good. You should give it a moment. So when a, when a vacuum tube has been sitting for decades, even though there's a, a uh, you know, it's a super protected thing inside the glass envelope, it's evacuated small amounts of gas. Sorry, that I heard something there. Small amounts of gas will be produced coming out of the different metals and elements that are inside the tube in the vacuum. So over time, the, uh, the, the gas level in the tube may go up. That's a problem. You don't want gas in the tube. You don't want air molecules of any sort or any kind of gas molecules floating around it in the tube. Um, so the tube has a thing called a getter in it, which is a, a chemical which has been s splashed up onto the side of the glass tube, usually inside. That's shiny stuff you see. Uh, can't kind of see it down here on these two tubes. And that, for the life of the tube, is drawing out gas molecules. It's absorbing gas molecules. And so, uh, uh, right at this, during manufacture, when they're done, there's gas in the tube as much as they've tried to evacuate it. The getter collects a bunch of it, and then there's enough getter left. Ooh, what was that sound? Did I hear something there? Okay, I don't hear a thing. So, the uh, I thought I heard a of a capacitor giving up its ghost there. Uh, had a couple exciting ones in the last while. Remember, there's no high voltage in this radio now. It's not there. So a lot of the parts are not being stressed. I think I'm going to shut this off now. To finish the getter story, well, the getter can only getter so much until the getter is has gotten until, until it's spent. Normally I found very few tubes with spent getters and they've almost always had a cracked glass envelope and it's allowed volumes of gas air right into the tube and the getter has just been consumed by all the air in the tube. So when you take a tube that's been sitting around for decades the first time you operate it there's a good chance that there's gas in the tube that, that really should be gettered the getter doesn't work till it gets hot the tube has to get hot for the getter to start working so uh, i've ne never paid any attention to this i'm just aware of it but you know what can you do about it when you're doing this stuff not a lot that's why i mumbled about is it good to leave these things operating for a while this is just a little bit warm it's not not very warm at all this one might be a little hotter even that's not very hot because I restricted restricted the power coming over here. They didn't really get heated up full. And then I forgot to look at the magic eye to see if it was glowing. Okay, next test is much more dramatic. Next test is uh, to have the speaker uh, field coil connected to the radio and this will allow high voltage to cast through the radio including these capacitors which you know what the next test is? The next test is to apply a high voltage to the high voltage circuits using a power supply, which would be this one up here. 
and then we can control the amount of current flowing and we can find out if there's some real sick thing going on in there without without endangering things I thought I'd take another glance at the schematic before uh, taking the next step and I have become paralyzed look at this 600 watt speaker field what are they talking about here 600 watts that's a space heater 600 watts that mean the, the radio is only gonna draw 60 80 watts maybe a hundred in this radio because of all the tubes in it I wouldn't even think that much what are they talking about here or is that not a watt symbol oh, that's I'll bet you that's ohms yeah that's what that's gonna mean that's what that has to mean doesn't look like the ohm symbol very well, but I can't be 600 watts. That's crazy. Okay, 600 ohms. Well, I can measure. That's a that's great. I can measure that. I imagine that's 600 ohms uh, DC. I'm going to try measuring this. Okay, maybe that was a bit of a lucky break. In fact, let's see how close this speaker is. Now, so which 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 of the <laughs> there's a bit of a problem here in that there's five wires leaving this, but there's only four prongs. So two of the wires are connected to the same prong. And I think that's going to be uh, it could be the center tap wire is grounded along with one of the yeah what what is common I see I'm having deja vu here I'm having a lot of deja vu something must be common in here maybe I can figure out what is what Let's look, let's look back at the schematic again. So, uh, wow, this is hard to look at. So here's the B plus coming out, and it reaches one of the thicker pins here, and comes out of the other pin. This is the field coil. It'll go through the field coil. It, it's here. Here it is. It comes out here. Goes through the field coil. And then the positive is fed here. And for and so this is the output. This is yeah, this is the output from the the, uh, the output tubes. These two, these two guys here, their output is on pins. So yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm not making a lot of sense, but I don't need to at this point. No no sense is needed. Um, so I'm going to try to connect just these to here with some clips, basically, and leave the rest of this unconnected to anything, so it's not connecting to a speaker. So, um, so that, that leaves the plate circuit open here, I believe, because the only way it gets its feed is, uh, through through here uh, yeah yeah because because the, the output winding is here and the other output winding is here and that's how you get the plate voltage hey what's this this must be a tone control they had to do a dual tone control on each plate huh okay never seen that before that's interesting. Uh, okay, so uh, so the bottom line is, if I hook up the field coil, then we're going to get uh, power uh, through here onto this line. So we're going to get B plus showing up on most of the tubes, just not the output tubes. The output tubes are shut off from operating when the when there's no uh, 
when the uh, output transformer is not connected up. That's not a problem. Uh, everything else, though, will start operating. We'll, 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 yeah, it will start trying to operate. Okay, I'm very hesitant because, um, you know, there's a lot of pitfalls in doing this, and there could easily be stuff I'm just not waking up to. Or uh, just reading some notes here because you should read the notes before doing anything. There's no other notes to read. Put them way down here. C35 and C32. Yeah, those are the two uh, that I was looking at in the schematic before. Okay, great. I think I think we're ready here. Okay, so the two large or the the, the uh, uh, field coil is connected at these two terminals. This is a pretty light wire, but it'll probably do the trick. Now, what about up here? How, how, how do we know up here? How do we know? Wow. Um, yeah. How can you tell which wire is which? There's, there's guess this one's here and this one I don't know and this one I don't know none of them I know I don't know so this screw is not a nut screw it's just a metal screw let's take it out the thing is these uh, wires wow that's pretty stiff these wires might be so stiff oh careful man poke the uh, if I drop the screwdriver I'll go right through the uh, Hello, mirror. How do mirrors work? Not the way you think. Okay. I got a better mirror. I got a better mirror. This one here. Look at that. What a light. Fantastic. Okay, so following those two, you can see one wire is connected here, and the other one is connected here, and there's another wire connected. There's two wires onto this terminal here. So this is the, uh, that's how you get four terminals and uh, five wires. So, so which ones did I say it was? I say it's the two that are close together, the two pins close together. These two. These two pins. Oh. Do you really need a lock washer under here? Well, maybe because, uh, you know, the speaker vibrates, right? You shake everything loose in the long run. Okay, uh, so we're flipping here. This is the thinking. Not going to make the speaker make any sounds. But it will make this into a magnet. Not much of a touch there. Oh, you know what I was going to do? I was going to run this before I do this. Yes, you know, I almost forgot. That's okay, getting this set up is fine, but we're going to do this later. First, I've got to do with the power supply. That's okay. That's good. I think we'll have some coffee and then we'll, we'll do that step. Okay, another peek at the schematic here. Where am I going to hook up my power supply? So I want the power supply, the high voltage power supply, to imitate this tube. Uh, the, this is not going to be heated up, so nothing's going to be heated up. None of these tubes are going to be hot uh, during this first test. 
So this is the output of a high voltage, positive, coming up here. And you see it ties to one of the two field, field coil terminals. And the other field coil terminal is tied to um, is, is tied to another pin. So we can identify these two because one of them is tied to another pin. This one should be receiving a positive voltage. And the other side of my power supply if we follow this here, high voltage winding here, we see the center tap right to the chassis here. So the other side of my power supply goes chassis. So I go chassis and on uh, the pin that the pin that does not have the jumper, the jumperless pin. Okay, I got it. Jumperless pin. So looking in here, uh, here's the jumper. These are the two field coil terminals. So this is the one that gets the positive. So, so this this cable goes up to my little power supply up here. So red is positive. Are you are you positive on that, Jen? Yeah, I am. Okay, so we're going to put this on here, and then this just goes to ground in some nice, convenient location right on the chassis. Okay, now the whole objective of this is to find out if an excessive current flows when uh, high voltage is applied to this radio. And you're looking for a short or some kind of component that might be uh, causing that, that problem. So what we're, we're going to do, so we're going to turn this to standby. This has a tube in it, it has to warm up for a moment has a meter here indicates current flow and a meter here indicates voltage. These meters are not accurate at all. But they give you some rough idea of what's going on. This one's already up a little bit. So when I turn the switch on, it will then apply a DC voltage here and I can control the level with this knob. The voltage, I can see it going up and we can watch how much current flows. Uh, maybe you can't quite see it, but there's a red mark right here. That's marking where it's too much for this guy if it gets up there. Most radios drawing 10, 20 milliamps under this kind of test. Not very much at all. Just way, way, way down here. That's what I would expect to have happen. Okay, and the switch, doesn't matter what position the radio switches in, we are ready to go. So I want to keep an eye on those meters. It's not really about the radio, it's about those meters. Okay, you can kind of see them there. Okay, so we're going to go on. Now I'm going to start cranking up the voltage. You can see this one's going to go up, and we'll watch this one. It'll probably do this thing. Each time it's charging, each time I crank it up, it charges up the capacitor. So it's probably going to do this kind of action. Here we go. Okay, looking very good. Because if there was a problem, I wouldn't even get this off the ground before this thing would be way up there. So we're only at 50 volts on that meter. So we're getting up around 100 volts now. And you can see this went up and then it goes down as the capacitors charge. That's pretty good. Now B plus in this radio, I don't know what it is. We could guess it's 250 volts. Lands if we get up to 250 volts. That's 150. So you go up and now it's going down again. That's 200 according to this meter. It's very inaccurate. 30 milliamps here. This meter is pointing straight up in case you can't. I know it's really hard to see in here, isn't it? I don't exactly have studio lighting. Okay, we're going to push it up to 250. Let that soak in for a bit. We're running around, uh, to, I think I may have said the wrong number before. That's about, oh, do you see that? Ooh, 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 something went wild there. I, 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 hope, I hope that came out on the video because that was an exciting moment. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but something happened. Kind of went up and came right down again. 
that a good sign or is that a bad sign? <laughs> well, it's a sign of things to come. If we power this with the radio's own power supply, it has a lot more power available to drive into a problem like that and cause smoke and excitement. On this one, all that happens is meter goes up. We're at uh, 200 volts again. I, th I pushed it up to 250 and it did that funny thing. Hey, let's see if it'll do the funny thing again. Uh, no, I'm trying not to jump so fast this time. Okay, it didn't do the funny thing. Anybody getting warm here? Well, on that kind of current, I don't think anything's getting warm. Just feeling my field coil field coil wire here to see if it's warming up. Not at all. Nothing. No, there's not enough current here to heat anything up. Don't take your eyes off the meter. So 250 is high enough to, to do this test. What that momentary flip was, I don't know. Could it have been something failing and literally burning itself clear? It could have. Didn't hear anything. It didn't hear any snaps. So I really don't know what that might have been. No, it's right down at, this is actually 10, 10 milliamps on this meter, which is quite low, quite a low, low current. This is because the tubes are not hot. If we let the tubes heat up, then we would get a very different current response here. But that's not what I'm looking for. I am looking for how much current does this thing draw just sitting here. So most of the, the current that's drawn here will be through resistors and other things uh, to ground. Some of that could be capacitor leakage. How much? I don't know. I, I don't know how you even discern it. Uh, gee, any switches I should throw? Anything? I don't think so. Um, any reason to leave this here for a long time? I also don't think so because I don't think it'd be wise to, to leave the shop with this on because we already saw something happen at one point. Could just a loose wire here have caused the current meter to jump up? I don't think so. It jumped down, not up. It went up. Well, I think this bodes well for, uh, for using the uh, radio power supply. The other thing about the radio power supply is there's no there's no current meter. I'd have to figure out how to do a current meter. I might be able to put a current meter into the circuit and keep an eye on it uh, because if it were to jump up like we saw this one here jump up, how are you going to know? You're going to know when the smoke and flames come out. That's how you're going to know. Although if I can keep the dim bulbs in, uh, they also will... Yeah, the dim bulbs are the way to save the save the show. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop here for a minute and have a little coffee. I'm going to turn all this stuff off. I better do that right now because if I know what will happen. I'll forget. It's more than once I've come back in my shop late in the day and everything is on and some radios on <laughs> my bench because I left and just never returned. So good, everything's safe and secure. Go drink coffee. Okay, I think I'm ready to go here. So I've got a ammeter connected here. Let me just, it's a clamp on ammeter. I don't want to put an ammeter right in the circuit because I don't really know what kind of current's gonna flow here. And if there's a problem, that current could be really high and ruin my, my meter. So I'm using a clamp on ammeter. Uh, right now it's reading 0.005. I'm, I'm sure you can't see the decimal point, but that's what it's actually reading, 0 0.007. That's what it's reading now. Okay, um, I've undone one light bulb, so it's just the one small light bulb. So we start up with a very low voltage being applied to the radio. Uh, field coils connected. The speaker is not, so so there's there's no chance of sound from the speaker. don't know what the current is here that I should get excited about. Um, 20, 30 milliamps. 
could be much more than that in fact and still be normal so one of the things I want to watch out for is this thing heating up but it takes time something dramatic were happening that I, I, the, the drama might be over before I realize what's happening but I think with this meter I'm fairly safe from that okay I think we're ready and the switch is on the switch is on Okay, I guess all eyes on the meter here. Let me zero it again. Here we go. Zero, zero, zero here. Why would this be zero? So the rectifier tube has not heated up enough to... Here's starting to come now. Three. Four. That probably represents the rectifier tube heating up going to heat up really slowly because probably the voltage supplied on the radio right now most of the supply voltage dropping on that bright light bulb so very very slow heating effect happening here but it is going up and you might think operating tube heaters at a lower temperature is okay it's a higher temperature that's a problem but there's actually a temperature range a lower temperature range you do not want to operate your tubes in uh, for reasons I can't remember now. So we're looking at uh, 12 milliamps here so far. That's getting to be similar to what was coming out of my power supply. But this should go much higher than that because the uh, power supply wasn't supplying current to all the tube plates. And that's where we're going with this. Don't know what the B plus is. I should have set up a meter to read the B plus. I can still do that. No reason I can't do that. It's probably next to nothing at this point. So put this on 600 voltages here. And we want to touch a capacitor, positive capacitor. So there's one hidden way back in there. Oh, give me some light. Show me some light. How about this lousy flashlight? Yikes. Oh my, what have they done there? Oh, I didn't really look at this before. So... Okay, so that's attached there, and then it comes up. Not sure what's going on there, but it could be B plus is sitting right here. Let's see. Nothing showing up there. And we got 31 milliamps flowing now. I, mean, I can't imagine the tube. I, mean, I won't be able to see if the tubes are actually heating up yet. able to operate yet okay so I'm gonna lower the general supply voltage and then screw in another light bulb and that'll bring it up quite a bit can you see the two lights are on here hard to see eh? so we're gonna take this down then I'm gonna screw in this other light bulb and that's gonna jack up the voltage there we are current now 37 milliamps that's not very much looking for some B plus voltage somewhere in this radio. Um, the other capacitor, I can get at it easier here. 32. 20, why is it going down? Am I bleeding it off? Am I bleeding it off with the meter? That can't be the case. 38, slowly going up here. Still, I think it's fine. There's Looking again. 25, 25.1, holding steady. I, I don't know what I what I saw there before. 40 now. B plus at this other end. You can also look for it right on the. Uh, right on, let's look for it right here. 
25 volts. That's what we're generating. Not very much. The uh, dim bulbs are not dropping much voltage anymore. This guy, he's discombobulated. So I'm going to interrupt the power briefly and then turn it back on. And that's going to bring this guy to proper life. We'll know what we are feeding into the radio. 62 volts. About half what it's really intended for. How, how, how come? Uh, that doesn't quite make sense. 62 volts, but the lights are uh, hardly on. Supposing I'm dropping 62 volts across here. Those lights should be bright. Oh, I turned it down. I turned it down over here. Yeah, that's right. Okay, we're turning it back up. We're going up. We're going up. 75 volts. Okay, 75 volts on the power cord. 50 milliamps flowing here, roughly. This is what we're really interested in, right? No, not this. This. I've been touching the wrong thing. This is ice cold. Ice cold. 40 milliamps doesn't mean much to this. Now, let's read the B plus again. Now, now we've got a little more choose here. Instead of 25, what's it now? 60. Still way low. Well, it's only 75 volts making it to the radio. Let's, let's crank this up. 80, 85. 90 is usually where I like, and the lowest I like to be. Can I get there? 89. I find at 90 volts a lot of radios will operate. Now we got some B plus there, one, 150 volts. So the radio is supporting the B plus for now. So I think if I were, it's 88 volts coming into the radio, if I set it to, you know, if I let in say 100, this is going to go to 200 and something volts, the B plus. Over here we've got 30 milliamps flowing. That's not much at all. That's not going to heat this guy up very much. If it was an amp, I'd be freaking out. So, uh, options here are to uh, take the dim bulbs out of the circuit, but I'm not going to do that because we saw a momentary glitch there earlier. We don't know what the glitch is and what it might lead to. Dim bulbs keep everything pretty safe. If a short develops here, the bulbs go bright, current is restricted, my wife continues watching TV upstairs. Should probably let this operate for a while. What would the next step be? The next step would be to take the dim bulbs out of the circuit and uh, run it right off. Well, I have fuses. I have other things in the circuit here. There's a circuit breaker inside this guy back here. And ultimately, I, I do have a circuit breaker, of course, in the fuse panel. While we're running at 88 volts here, everything seems very steady and stable. Don't hear anything. Don't smell anything. So let's, let's do that. Let's get rid of the dim bulbs. So I'm going to turn this way down way down to around the 88 mark. Now I'm going to throw a switch and put the 88 onto the radio. The 88 is actually 86, so it's pretty close. So I'm going to raise this up now to like 100 volts. This is where I really want to go. 100 volts, here we go. Now there is a lot of talk. I've I've heard a lot of talk or read stuff about reforming capacitors. Uh, I'm not a believer in that my, myself, but maybe that's what's going on here to some degree. The uh, big old electrolytic capacitors are are uh, their health is improving here. I I don't particularly believe in that. 
Well, I don't think anything is terribly going wrong here. I mean, I'm not pushing any buttons or working any controls. We do not have the output hooked up to the uh, speaker. Is that the next step? That might be the next step. I have to bring three, three, well actually two more wires because one wire is shared. That's the thing about these speakers too is sometimes they have a common ground wire so there's the wire coming to the voice coil and going back on the ground and then there's also other voltages coming up. Did I say voice coil? I, I, I said that wrong. <laughs> Ignore what I'm saying. Uh, think man, what are you going to do now? Everything is stable. I think I'm going to stop for today and tomorrow we'll look at trying to make some sound come out of this radio. I'm amazed I got this far. I, I really am. Great. 31 milliamps. 100 volts looking good okay well thanks a lot for watching let me just cut the power off here before I forget thanks a lot for watching and uh, tomorrow we'll just go another step uh, another couple steps and see where we get to see ya